another. Even Philippians, Lord, you said it's to be a one mind and one spirit, Lord God, that it pleases you. In even the beginning of the church, they were all in one accord, in one place. Lord, teach us to be unified. It doesn't matter what our opinions, what our, what our decisions are. It matters what your decision is, what you want for us to do. And we can harmonize in that. So we have set ourselves in agreement over those that are coming, those that are here. Lord, we just welcome the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth and get through Hebrews chapter 11, which is very much full of meat and the center of really what we believe and that is we believe Jesus is better than just about anyone. In, in fact, everyone, right? <laughs> in Jesus' name. And everyone said, all right, the book of Hebrews, the life of faith. Really, it's a life. He's the alpha and the what? Omega. So follow along as we fill in your blanks there in your opening statement there. Tonight, we are to start chapter 11 of this letter of exhortation to the Hebrew Christians. In this chapter, we will see how it's by faith faith, we please God, and how to trust and rely on God above and beyond our physical senses. A few blanks, faith, and then senses. Now, if you guys hear a cat, it's not a cat, it's just a little bit of, of uh, loose, unelectrified uh, little thing over here. Sounds like a cat going, yeah, once in a while. It's mechanical, it's not a cat. Yeah, amen. Okay. So again, <clears throat> all right. We will start out looking at faith as a substance and powerful in trusting God. And then from there, we will see how through faith, the ages were framed and lives were changed. We will see faith revealed through the dawn of history and how the patriarchs trusted in God with many of them not in their lifetime receiving the promises but saw them afar off. Now, okay, receiving and saw should be your two, two last blanks. Many of those lives uh, have changed. They lost their lives because they believed, saw it in half. Here, the author relates well on how faith, not works, were why these patriarchs have all received such recognition. Remember, the Hebrew believers were renouncing Christ and going back into the old style of Old Testament beliefs. Here, the writer of this epistle wants to point out the danger of leaving the faith for the works, that's your next blank, of the law, and to point out that the heroes of their Jewish history were heroes for their trust and faith in the promises of God. Amen? Abraham bosom or paradise was filled with them. People say, well, how did they get saved in the Old Testament? They got saved through faith. Not by sacrifices, not by following the law, not by shaking the priest's hand. No, by faith. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, in your, in your scripture there in Romans chapter 4, 1 through 12, I'm going to read rather quickly. It talks about Abraham. It says, what then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? Now, remember, Christians today, I'm, I'm just wondering, how do they even walk? Because there are two, I'm going to say this to you. I had a guy in, in, in the mall that I minister to every time I can get together with him as we're walking. His name's Gary. He's a wonderful man. I told him there's two of them. There's two Garys and there's two Carries. What do you mean? There's the old Carry and there's the new Carry. There's the old Gary and there's the new Gary. But you have to differentiate when you're reading the Bible. You're going to have to differentiate between what is the old Carrie or the old Joe or the old Denise, or what is the new? And we have to line those things up with the scripture. Romans 12 tells us that it says we're not to be conformed to this world. That deals with the outward, the old man, but rather be transformed in the renewing of the mind. That is the new man. Can you see, amen? Take off the old man, put on the new man. So we can't walk around as Christians or calling ourselves Christians and living in the dictation of, the, of our carnal flesh. It doesn't work. So that's why people look and say, you know, I'd love to be a Christian, but I've seen so many poor examples of them. Hello. And yeah, we know what people aren't supposed to have their eyes on us, but they do. Paul warned us that sometimes we're the only epistles that people see and read. 
They're going to know Christ by our living testimony and our walk. Yeah, that's not to say we don't have a bad day. That's not to say that things don't bother us and we don't get frustrated about some things. But listen, I've always told my ministers and people in the church, and you guys can bear witness, that if you're going to go out and make a big boo-boo, do it all by yourself. Let nobody see it. Amen? Because when somebody makes a boo-boo and then they start drawing attention, it's all an attention getter. And we're supposed to be dead. Can you say amen? So you're going to make mistakes. And when you do, just try to do them alone. (laughs) Come on, we can laugh a little bit at it. So that we don't affect in a negative way anybody else. So what are we going to do? Go run and hide? No, not necessarily. Amen. What we're going to do is we're going to walk closer to God so that we don't slip as much. Can you say amen? All right, so again, what shall we say about Abraham according to the flesh? Well, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Abraham, man, I tell you, he was an awesome guy. Sometimes, a lot of times, you guys are awesome, right? But not before God. Do you see how that's said? Why? Because human effort cannot glory in God. Oh, yeah, God's pleased about how that you might be able to do certain things. I can play drums, but he is really pleased when I play him in Jesus. Can you say amen? All right, uh, verse three. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. People are trying to live up to the standard of God. And they're doing it because they feel guilty. And they're doing it because they feel they owe God a debt. Hello? I mean, it's natural for the natural man to think that. But how many here know that even in our debt and trying to pay our debt back, it will always fall short of the glory of God? Verse 5 says, But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man whom God imputes righteousness apart from the works. You see, if we, got, we did something great and it was mighty, it was pretty impressive, who gets the credit? We get the credit if we're strutting our stuff about it, but who should get the credit? And Randall said that God should get the credit. So here's how we get in trouble. Remember the Israelites. I love them. Bless the Jewish people. They brought forth the Messiah. But they came up to Moses as Moses. When you get up there and talk with God, you just tell him, we have it all together. We can do whatever he asks us to do. That's the attitude. Well, think about what kind of attitude. What would happen to you and I? Thank God the ground didn't open up and swallow us. Well, what would happen to our day if we stood around with that kind of attitude? Hey, God, I'm up this morning. I know you're impressed. And but... Plus, God, you know, I'm, I'm doing all these works, and I really expect you to give me the raise I asked you for. What, what is evident? Do you see the Lord in that kind of talk? Or what is inevident in that kind of talk? Well, we know human pride. And I'm just making a goofy effort of doing that. And the reason being is a lot of times we can hear it in other people, but oftentimes don't hear it in our own voice, that creepiness of that carnal's Pride that kind of sneaks out what's well. Did you have your hand up? Two Sundays ago, yeah. Couldn't do it, could you? Just remember that. Well, think about it. I'm trying to relate this, this passage about faith to our own personal life as well. And I can tell you in my, in, in my nature, there's a natural uh, wanting of dropping names. You ever been to a pastoral meeting or a, a ministerial meeting and people, you hear people dropping names? You know, I was at this meeting and I saw so and shook hands with so-and-so and I did this and I did that. Be careful not to do that. If somebody wants to know who you've been around, let them look it up. Why? Because you see a lot of that in the Northwest. Just people dropping names and who do you know, who do you not know. That is important. You know Jesus. 
In fact, you shouldn't have to say anything about what you know or not know. Why? Because it should be evident because out of the abundance of the heart, the what? The monk's mouth speaks. So what comes out of our mouth is a combination, and we should be aware of it now. I'm just talking to myself here, is a combination of both carry and the newborn creation carry. And they both come out of the same orifice, but comes out of two fountains, a bitter fountain in James, a sweet fountain in James. Bitter comes out of the soul of an unrenewed, maybe upset, frustrated, stressed out mind. And the other comes out of the spirit. Remember, your spirit's perfect. Got God in there. So only sweet water come out of your spirit. You don't have an ugly spirit. Your spirit leap out, look at you. <laughs> no, you don't have an You have a perfect, complete spirit with God dwelling on the inside of it. No, and again, I'm going to say something we all need to hear probably a thousand upon thousand more times. And that, so that's why Paul says, walk in the spirit or in the realm up from the spirit. Why? And you will not fulfill the lust, the lusting or desires to be number one of your flesh. Okay. Now we've asked the story uh, Sunday and I, I let some things leak out. We were talking and praying and asking God for revival. Right? Okay. Now think about it. How, has God given all of his love to us? Does he have any more he's holding, withholding from us? No, otherwise then we feel like we'd have to work for more or huh? Did God give his power at Pentecost? Is he withholding any more of his power from us? No. What I'm trying to do is paint a better picture for our understanding to go. These Hebrew Christians, they didn't understand that they were swimming in God. But their focus was on themselves and what they were going through so much that they were bound by fear. They were frustrated. Now, I'm going to say some things to you that come right out of heaven. I didn't think these up, didn't borrow them from a book, although I love reading some good books. They're great, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, especially the Bible. And that is, if God gave all of his love, all of his power, all of his peace, all of these things, when the church was born in Pentecost, and all we need to do is wake up, accept it by faith, and receive it, then I would say we were the closest thing to revival that there ever is. Now, the problem is you and I go in and out of humanness, in and out of the spirit, in and out probably a thousand, ten thousand times a day. And the longer you stay in the spirit, the more saturated you become, the more like Jesus you reflect, and the more or less disruptions of your flesh and frustration comes out. Why? This is God turning you in, and literally, like a, mo a moth, you are metamorphosizing into a creature that literally can handle the power of God and not worry about anything else because you died to your flesh, and now you're alive to God, and God's power is residing on the inside of you. Now, take a breath. And let's ask God to keep us, help us from floating in and out of ourselves. Now, I, you ask me to say that again. I don't think I can. That came right out of the spirit. So don't pray just for revival. I'm going to say there's nothing wrong with that. Pray for God to revive you and condition you for what's to come. Hello. Hello. It's coming. Revival is here. But what brings it closer to us is us drawing closer to God. Draw closer to me and I will draw near to you. Draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. Well, we're waiting for God to slap us upside the head so we can go fall, feel bad and fall on our knees and repent. And then we get a, a little goose bump from God and say, oh, it's all right. Then we go right out in our carnal self and commit the crime again because we're not soaking up God like we need. We're not letting God go in and make the inside adjustments in us that we need. I'm in a hurry to get things done. Oh, I rush and rush until life's no fun. It's still about me. Still about me. And believe me, you're going to catch yourself. The longer I preach this kind of stuff, this is one of the first sermons Jesus said. If you desire to come where I am, well, look at all the people that did. Then you've got to deny yourself. 
You, you mean my growth is a denial of myself and an openness to God will cause me to grow faster and stronger and quicker? Yes! Amen. It's not the devil hindering you. It's us yielding to the old concepts of the old societies and the things that we learned. Even in religion, even in some of our old churches we went to, some of that's just plain bunk because it produced no fruit. Okay. This is what these guys were going through. So he says, now look, reflect to Abraham here. Okay? Okay. Blessed are those lawless deeds that are forgiven. How many here are glad you're forgiven? Okay. Blessed is the man that the Lord will not impute sin. How many here are glad that God's not holding our sin against us? We hold it against others. But not, we, he's not and does this blessedness that come up from circumcision only? Are you just so blessed because you're a Jew? Or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. Now, we're in verse 10 of Romans 4. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. In other words, Abraham received his covenant from God by faith 30 years before, or 25 years before he actually was physically circumcised. So did it come from him getting his flesh cut? Or did it come from him believing in God? Believing in God. So he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith that he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe. Though they are uncircumcised, the righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, Jewish, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while he was still uncircumcised. What's he saying? God doesn't look at the circumcision of your flesh. He looks at the circumcision of our heart, right? All right, there's three points underneath that. Faith, number one, is what brings about justification, fully trusting in God for life. What if something happened to you? Who would you have to trust to to guide you and and to lead you right on through that problem? Jesus, right? Amen. All right, point two. Abraham was justified by faith and made right or made righteous even before he was circumcised. So point one, trusting. Point two, before. And then here we're in three. These Hebrew Christians were forgetting this powerful point. The law could not save or restore mankind to a rightful place with God, so why go back into it? I had a guy on Facebook, bless his heart, I don't want to mention his name too much, but he comes up with these statements so he can get people to challenge him. And some of it are just so off the wall. Like like he said today, and I wasn't trying to pay attention, I was looking for somebody else's tweet or, or Facebook thing, and it says, God, Yahweh, Never had an altar call. And I can think of about 18 altar calls he had in the Old Testament. What are you talking about? To call to repent, a solemn assembly. You know, and he's just blurting out things, hoping that somebody's going to try to correct him. All he wants to do is argue and debate. Well, my Bible says in Romans that I'm not to debate the gospel. Let it debate itself. Let the Bible defend itself. You stand in Christ and love others. All right, moving right along. Okay, next First point, first, first scripture in Hebrews 11. And let's buzz through this. I love you guys. All right. Hebrews 11, one through three. Now, most of you know the message of faith, and I don't want to play this down at all. But when we're talking about faith, we're not just talking about one action. Because it's going to mention one action. But all of these men and women that are listed in Hebrews chapter 11, are, that's just talking about their whole life. Abraham's talked about several times. Why? Because of Sarah and having Isaac and then offering Isaac and then looking for a city and builders God. So I want to let you know that it is the beginning of your faith and to the ending of their faith, also the beginning of our faith and the ending of our faith or the ending of this natural life. Can you say amen? 
So, Hebrews 11, verse 1, understand by faith. God has done, is doing, and will always do things it takes faith to understand. I mean, how can you look out in the middle of the darkness? Because our mind wants to figure things out. Amen? And Glenn says, yeah, sometimes it's just beyond the mind. God looks out in that mass darkness and says, light me! And then says something later on, Corinthians, he says, and God calls the things that are not as though they are. You're going to have to understand that by faith. Amen? Amen. Because the moment we start reasoning, we're going to come up something like you crawled out of the ocean under Darwin, you know, theory. Listen, one of the biggest lies ever sold us, turn of the century, was Darwinism. A total lie from the pit of hell. Yeah, the idea, and not only that, so many people bought into it and spent billions, possibly even billions of dollars in education and everything. Now, if anybody stands up and challenges it or discovers something, the Smith, uh, Smithsonian is called in, all this called in, because we don't want you to upset the apple cart of this Darwinism. See what I'm saying? And it said, in the last days, men will believe a lie. Take changing the natural use, you see, and all that kind of crazy stuff. So, again, so here we go, verse one. Now faith is, all deals with the now, doesn't it? Three words. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. For by faith we understand that the worlds or ages, actually this word aeon, ages were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things that are visible. Can you see God? No, not unless God reveals himself, but he's far realer than the very seat we're sitting on. And you know, the reason why we don't believe that is we see physical things coming and going and being not steady and, and fluctuating, you know, and doing all that kind of stuff. Yet God remains the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, why does he seem a little different now than when I first got saved? Because you grew a little. Your brain's got a little more room to understand it his way. His ways are higher than our ways. Okay, all right, let's move right on. So for by it, the elders, or those in, uh, that are older, obtained a good testimony. By, by faith, we understand the worlds or ages were framed by the word of God, that the things we're seeing were not made of things that are visible. Four points underneath that. Hope is what came first. It's the substance of things what? Okay, there are three, there are two what I call partner buddies with faith. Faith brings substance of what? Things hope for. Hope is what you have in your mind. If you don't think you can do it, you think that you're a no good Nick, you'll never amount to anything, you vacillate, put yourself down, there isn't any hope. You're deferring your hope. The scripture says in the King James, hope deferred make it the heart sick. In other words, if you have nothing to look forward to, nothing to plan, get in the word of God and let God build hope in you. Abraham believed in hope, who, who against hope believed in hope, became the father of many nations. So faith needs hope to work towards, but faith will not work unless we are in a love condition. Faith worketh by love. So guess what? If you're upset at everybody, your faith is not going to go anywhere. Maybe to the cross to ask God to forgive you. <laughs> Don't throw anything at me. Hello. Faith works by love. So the more love you can saturate yourself in the presence of God, the more your faith will be carried into the things you hope for. Amen. Let me ask you. What do you hope for? You see, most people can't put it in specifics. They have these grandiose hopes, and they're great. I hope for heaven. Well, that's the hope of our calling. I hope for healthy life. Good, that's good. I hope for prosperity. Amen. So faith begins to bring substance to the thing you hope for. So somebody comes up to you and says, you know what? You're looking awful. But your, faith, but your hope 
says, man, you're, you're chilling and you're moving. So do you want to replace the way God made you feel with your hope? Or do you want to listen to what somebody said about your life and allow it to dial a negative vision so your faith has nothing to work for? You see how it works? And so what does the enemy do? He tries to lace our thinking with negative thoughts. You're not going to get that. Look, you should have been a lot further on in your growth with the Lord till now. And he's always laying the guilt on us. We need to learn to sift it. So faith work it by love and bring substance to things hope for, okay? I can't spend a whole lot of time on there because we'd be here all day. So hope is what came first. The faith works toward the end to bring hope, bring it to pass. Point two, you could only get a good report card when fully trusting in God. Could you imagine how many times those people in the Old Testament thought about giving up? But they pressed on, didn't they? Amen. That's why they're in this chapter. Point three, God brought about the visible by his faith. And only by faith can we understand this. I mean, why would God love somebody like me? Only by faith I can understand it. Somebody says, well, except I see a miracle. Just look right here. Me, I'm a miracle. I'm changed. Anybody that knew me back, they know that God has visited Jerry. <laughs> My wife's up there going, yes, amen. And then point four, God calls the things that are not as though they, as though they are, amen. I suppose you could write were in there, but they're all, it's, the word, it's the word are. Okay, anyway, next point. Faith at the dawn of the ages. Now, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4 through 7, if you can, read along with me. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Can anybody tell me in the theme that we're reading why Abel's sacrifice was accepted and Cain's was rejected? We got the blood, we got for self, both of those are right. But we're talking about a chapter on what subject? Faith, because Abel's was offered in faith and Cain's was offered by works. Now, one of the ways to help understand why our works is rejected. Now, remember, faith by works. Faith without works is what? Dead. So works are important. But where do they, did they go before faith or did they go after faith? After. Your emotions, should they inspire your faith or they should follow your faith? Follow your faith. Never inspire your faith. Because that's why people will go to a, a, like a revival meeting and they'll see people get healed and everything. And then they'll run up to the line because their eyes were tickled, their ears were tickled, they saw some people touched, but they haven't got an ounce of faith. It's all hope. And they go up there in themselves and in their own power, and it, it takes, they usually don't receive. And that's why you're all wanting to learn how ministry works. Well, there you go. I don't mind pouring my heart out to you. You know, uh, whether you want to deny it or not, that, that, that's how it works. Jesus couldn't even heal in his own hometown. Very little. Okay, all right. Now, let's go on. So it says, by faith, uh, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, though he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testified that his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks, because his blood still crying from the ground. Vengeance upon those that have taken my life. Point five, or excuse me, verse five, by faith, Enoch was taken away. He was raptured so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he what? He pleased God. So does your flesh, flesh please God? The scripture says no man can please God in the flesh. Hello? Romans 8, I think 8. Okay, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. Before he, he was taken at the testimony that he pleased God, but without faith, it's impossible to please God or please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that continually seek him or diligently or work hard to seek him. By faith, Noah, being uh, 
divinely warned of the things not yet seen, moved by godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Now, remember, I, all of these incidents are wonderful. I have great faith lessons in them, realizing that these people that God is using like that are just like you and I. We're bumbles. Bumbles bounce. Hello. We run into things. We bumble around. That's why bragging about how good we are at something really sounds stupid. It doesn't sound stupid for me to do that for myself. Yes, I'm an awesome drummer. Watch what happens next. <laughs> it boom, crash gong, yeah. So I'm just, I like to talk about myself that way. And it's good to laugh at yourself, you know? When you, oh, Lord, man. But don't call yourself names. God doesn't, don't you call yourself names. Let me encourage you that way. Are you with me? All right. So point one, Abel's sacrifice was according to God's design. In faith, not just what? Works. Because he did do a work, but it was after his faith, wasn't it? So it's faith, not just by works. Point two, Enoch pleased God by his faith. He was to become one of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. Why? Because he hadn't died yet. Neither did Elijah. Point three, or yeah, point three, it's appointed for a man to die once, then judgment. Hebrews, I think it's 127. Enoch didn't taste death yet. Point four, Noah by, fair, by faith prepared an ark to save his family and the human race and the animals. Point five, Methuselah preached up until the flood. His name meaning, when I shall die, it shall come. Did you know that? Well, it's just one of those little, I thought everybody kind of knew that. But anyway, what you got to realize is Noah was told, it took him 120 years to build that ark. Give or take a few days, you know what I'm saying? But right alongside that, there was a fellow named Methuselah. Okay? All right? Uh, was, uh, Methuselah was Enoch's grandson. Longest living physical man. He was living right alongside Noah when he was building the boat. So Noah was preaching that coming judgment was coming, it's going to rain, everybody laughed at him. And Methuselah was preaching, God is returning, he's going to bring judgment. You know, you better repent. And right on up to the time it started to rain and the ark door was closed, Methuselah died because his name said, when I die, judgment will fall. Isn't God precise. Yes, when he died, it started raining. Everybody went in, was into the ark, the animals were in, and they closed the door. God always leaves his footprint if we're not so caught up on religion. Are you with me? Methuselah, how many learned something new just for fun? Good, good. I like these new little things. Okay. All right, down to Hebrews 11, starting with verse 8. Faithful Abraham, as he clarifies and begins to focus in on Abraham. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place wherewith he would receive as an inheritance. Okay, he went out, not knowing that where he was going, but by faith he dwelt in the land of promise and as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Amen. Verse 11. And by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. She bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Talking about God. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Isn't that good? So we know, I've taught you enough, let's see if you get it. The stars of the sky represent what kind of, of seed of Abraham? And the sand of the shore represent what kind of the seed of Abraham? All right, you guys. 
I want you to take a nap, nap all the rest of the evening, and we'll come back tomorrow and answer that subject. It's simple. Stars are in where? They're in the sky. So it'd be heavenly children. And sand is on the what? Earth. So it'd be natural children. Natural children are Jews, the seed of Abraham. S stars are the spiritual ch uh, uh, of children. Those that have received Christ, whether they be Jew or Gentile, they're the heavenly children. So just because you're born a Jew doesn't give you a way to go to heaven. No, you have to get born again like anybody else. That's why we have the story of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He came. He was a religious leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night. Why? Because he didn't want his peers to make fun of him. He went to Jesus as a good master. What must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, you must be born again. He says, what? Do I go back up into my mother's womb? No, he says, that which is born of water, natural birth, and that which is born of the spirit, unless you're born of water and spirit, you cannot enter. Everyone say enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me tell you something about that. The kingdom of heaven sits right here in front of your face. It came at Pentecost. Part of heaven came down on the earth. Satan cannot partake of any of it. But we can in Christ by the blood, as Jesus said, or as Terry said earlier, we go in by the blood. Holy Spirit's the doorkeeper. We go in, get what we need, and then the Holy Spirit says, now I'll teach you how to use it. But not flesh and blood cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's why we, we try to act like we know it. We try to act like we can do it. Well, all we are is mimicking those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So the only access into the supernatural realm is through Christ by the Spirit. So we can't walk in the flesh because we'll be kept out of our answers to our prayers and the promises of God because it says that he walks in flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. Inherit means have entrance. Inherit means to get entrance and be subject of. So if you're in the flesh, you cannot be subject of the grace of God. God has to wait patiently until you get over yourself so we can humble ourselves so heaven can open. And God says, ah, been waiting a long time. We hear it. All oh, those who wait on the Lord shall renew. And I can hear God going, and I'm still waiting on you to come be with me. You're so caught up. We're caught up at... Listen, we're caught up in our work. We're caught up in doing things right. And, and that's okay. I'm not saying that's bad. But to do it without God's help is going to wear you right out. You're going to look older than you are. I've seen some people, that they're in their 90s, and then they look like they're somewhere around their 60s. Why? Because God sustained them. Oh, it's just their genes. I don't know. I wear Levi's. I, 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 all right, moving right along, Okay. So, point one, Abraham obeyed God by leaving his country and going to God's resting place, promised land, where God would build his city, New Jerusalem, or excuse me, uh, Jerusalem. Point two, Sarah finally believed God and had Isaac, who would bring about a great amount of offspring, spiritual as well as physical, stars of the sky, sand of the sea. Point three, she brought about a change in her body by believing God and trusting him. Remember, she tried to help God by uh, bringing Hagar in there, amen, and they produced an Ishmael. And really, the spiritual light as that is, anytime we try to do things on our own without asking God to get involved, you should really ask him if he wants you to do it first, but then getting him involved, we're going to produce an Ishmael. What do you mean? It's liable to kick us in the butt later on in life. Hello. So we want to minimize the Ishmael stuff. <laughs> the Ishmael represents our carnal religious self. That's who Ishmael is. That's, that's who Hagar, Hagar means. That's the, that's the law. Hagar is the law. Okay? All right? Sarah represents faith. Amen. And the law can't say. The law condemns. 
The law puts us up some things. We try as hard as we can. We seem to always fail. But Jesus says, hey, never you mind. I fulfilled the law. Now step your life in me and allow me to carry you through because I fulfilled the law and I will carry you into the glory by God. We have to trust him. Then preach myself happy, guys. All right. Question? That's what I just said, yeah. Free woman is grace. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. Right. In other words, don't go out and make an Ishmael. You know, oh, I went to church, but that pastor, he better get his act together. Keep on talking, kind of like thing. Come on, Bob, keep on sharing. Well, you do now, don't you? Go tell people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cain and Abel, same thing. How about, how, about here, how about this one, Jacob and Esau? Who does Esau represent? The flesh. Who does Jacob represent? Represents the, the spirit after we found Jesus. Because remember, Jacob's name was changed because he wrestled with Jesus. The angel of the Lord that he wrestled with was Jesus Christ before he became the Messiah. And he popped out his hip and he says, this is what the law will do for you. It'll knock you out of joint. And he says, but you're going to bless me. You're going to bless me. And of course, Jesus will come as Messiah and bless him. Amen. So yeah, all of those are types and shadows for our admonition and learning. But when you were those 12 years and all that, you didn't learn any of that, did you? Because they avoided telling you. That's right. Because... The law will never point to Christ uh, when somebody is representing the law because they get a lot of credit by making others and binding other people rules and regulations. The law will point to Christ with man doing what it says by saying the law is not to save us. So the law does point to Christ, but we usually mess it all up. Go ahead. Of the coming Messiah? Mm hmm. Yeah. 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 But he was counted to him for because of his faith, right? Now, we got his wife, the first wife that uh, Saul's daughter. Remember Saul's daughter? Here's a little lesson. Never despise another Christian in your heart. Never resent them. Never be jealous. Never talk evil about them. Because the moment you do, you will become barren. Unfruitful. Why? Well, Mikhail, Saul's daughter, despised David in her heart. So he lived with an egg. Hello. Now, like that, it says, it says it's better to eat vegetables on a rooftop than to eat steak with a, with a drippy faucet woman. Okay, now I don't know why they picked on God. I didn't, on the women, I don't, I didn't do that. So ladies, take a breath. I'm not picking on you. But where was David at when he got in trouble with Bathsheba? On the rooftop. Because Mikhail was such a poor wife, a nag, a complainer. She didn't like anything. And when David was rejoicing, when the ark came in and he was dancing around in his ephod, which he wasn't unnaked or anything, but he was in like a big, huge diaper and chest cover, and he was dancing around the street. She despised him in her heart. A little lesson to us. Law will always try to kill faith. Religion will always try to point out faults, while faith and grace will love. Religion will say, you better do this, well, grace says, here, let me help you do it. And we know who grace came by. For the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Yes. And Elisha had twice as many. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. <laughs> Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, probably not for you. You, you got to have the wisdom of God and know what the will of God is before you even step into something like that. 
not for me either. What do you mean? I, I wasn't saved and I saw a whole mouthful of teeth move. Well, I experienced a miracle. <laughs> Just didn't happen to me. Huh? You're just excited, aren't you, Bob? Well, you got to let me get through this lesson. Go tell the world, Bob. Go get four or five sinners in your hands. Now, I'm just amazed. We sit and we get all this great teaching, but some people, they're called to go out and outreach. Every healthy church has an in-reach, up-reach, and an outreach. Amen. There are those God puts in the church strictly to go out and do concerts, and minister on the streets to bring the people in. We have a couple of those here. I, to me, to get them out in the streets is like pulling a, you know, a cord. <laughs> they want to do something else. They don't want to do it. If they just started doing what God just asked them to do, and they would study and find out what their assignment is, and go do it, they'll be the happiest people on earth. And that's why you're so excited, because you need to be getting out there and sharing. All right. Amen. We're all excited. Bob, keep preaching. All right, so let's go on. <laughs> Bless you. Yeah, there you go. Right after we say amen, receive our offering, head right out there. It's still daylight. All right. <laughs> all right, so where do we stop? We stop at what, what script? 17? Okay, 13 through 17. Godly hope. Okay. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. But having seen them far off, were assured of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. We are. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had to come out, they would have opportunity to then to return. Like the Egyptian, I mean, excuse me, the Israelites wanted to go back to Egypt. But now they desired a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, we know at the end, there's going to be coming a new Jerusalem. And it's going to be filled with something. Can you, can you remember what it's going to be filled with? When the new Jerusalem comes down as a what? Yeah, a, as a, the bride prepared for her husband. See? That's why most people haven't got a clue. If you'll remember reading in Ephesians, that's all right. It's, that's, you're partly right. You remember reading in Ephesians, maybe in some in Colossians, I think it's mostly Ephesians, where, where it talks about that, and then in, in Peter, about a new heavens and a new earth, where comes the righteousness. But it says that literally, the city of God will be filled with those that are Jews and Gentiles, okay? So really, I know Dake goes into a really heavy explanation, but the Bible says that you and I are married to Christ. So we are kind of like a type and shadow of the bride of Christ. Now, I know for us guys, we're not female, but we're like married to Christ. And this is where our seriousness really comes on. When you say, I do, and better for worse, you know, until death do we part. I mean, you're married with Christ, but most of the Christians in America, they're just dating him. And I don't mean, to, it's not, I'm not a judge. I can't, I'm not smart enough to judge. But it seems like because it, it just, you, you can't count on them. They're not very dedicated. Now, you may not be that way, but see, you surrendered. Now, remember that what makes a marriage between a woman and a man so rich and so precious is not sex. It's not just communication. It's having Jesus be the center of that union. Now, the reason why many Christians today are miserable Christians is Jesus is not preeminent. He's not the center of that marriage. They love Jesus. They talk about Jesus, but they're really not surrendered to Jesus because they're afraid that the the, their husband, Jesus, is going to call them on a few things. <laughs> My wife calls me on a few things. Really? Huh? I call her on a few things. But God, we should give God the room to call 
Call on us. It says, look, Carrie, I want you to sit with me. There's a few things I want to talk to you about. <gasps> God's always gentle. He's full of love. And the fact that a person would feel that way when God calls them to spend time with him, that they feel like that shows them that they haven't really met with God very much. It's evident. They're, the way that they react, he raised them or tells on them. Amen. That's why I always ask pre- people, and I look them in the eye, and say, How how's it going? And immediately, I'll know. <laughs> so I get everybody, last Sunday, I'm doing good, I'm doing good. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> well, I'm the same way. All right, let's move on. <laughs> Point one, two, and three underneath those, okay? All right, okay. These believers trusted God for a homeland whose provider is what? God. Now, how many ever heard preached? that the promised land is like heaven. You ever heard that? It's not, but, you know, we're going to go to the promised land. We got gospel songs that say, we're coming to the promised land. Get on. No, the promised land is the walk of the New Testament. The walk in the wilderness is the walk of the Old Testament. Hmm? The, the walk of the promised land, walking into the promised land is a walk in the New Testament through grace. There's, because in heaven, there's no giants to fight, is there? There's no Jerichos to wipe out, is there? There's no rivers to part, is there? So the promised land has a walk of grace with God, while the wilderness was following God and dying to self. Sounds like the law to me. <laughs> yeah, amen. So again, Basically, what did God say? He said, I led you all these years in the wilderness to do what? Well, you guys need to know your Bibles. To test you, to see what is in your heart and your mind, that you may know to trust God and not to blasphemy. God said to the Israelites, when you get into the promised land, it's a reminder to all of us. When God begins to bless you and you live in houses that you didn't build and you ate, you eat meals that you didn't cook, McDonald's, Thai food, see? and you're driving cars you, you didn't build. I threw that one in there for fun. And you're eating a, a, a food that you didn't plant that you do not forget the Lord thy God who called you out of darkness and into the light. And that's what we suffer with. We suffer with a bunch of forgetful Christians, bless God, including myself, that sometimes gets our eyes off things that need to remind us where our eyes need to be. Hello? Now, the thing is, is sharing this stuff with us, please don't feel guilty. God doesn't do that. But if I've exposed some of the things that you need work on, you take what that is, Go to God, sit at his feet, and let God begin to work that out in you. My goodness, don't get mad at me. (laughs) We'll get mad at the preacher. Well, listen, I didn't say it. God's been telling you the whole time and finally made me say it so that you would be reminded that you're not listening. He's been calling you for a whole month. Do some changes here. But Lord, I'm too miserable to get any changes. (laughs) So then this is me playing, my heart cries for you. Believe me, I'm talking about myself. Man, there's times, how many times that we resist God and we're thinking we're doing all right? We're learning at our MTC courses that when the Holy Spirit's telling you to do something, do not take your time. Pay attention to when the Holy Spirit prompts you to do stuff and get it done in his timing. Don't ignore him. Ooh, it's not a good thing. All right, finishing up. Let's get beyond all this. All right, point two, did I do it? God is not ashamed to be called their God. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And then point three, the millennium, the new Jerusalem is what they're talking about. All right, now the faith of the patriarchs. Hopefully this will finish it up, I think. Is my close? All right, good, good, good. All right, not that I want to do that. Just remember, we stopped and talked about all these wonderful faith lessons. We'd be here for a week. I actually have a series out on it anyway. So by faith, point uh, 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, 
he offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Can you see the parallels in that? Folks, who gave his only begotten son? God. Why did he ask Abraham to give his only? Terry, did you want to try to answer this? Why he gave his only begotten son? Yes, exactly. So that tells, now listen. Listen to be careful. Listen. If God purposely looks at our faults, why didn't he know it was in Abraham's heart? Here's the only answer I can give you, and, I, and it might not be the right, total right answer, but he chooses not to look at our faults. Remember, he knows we have them. Somebody asked the question. This one's a tough one, but this is how I believe about it. Opinion, not so much gospel, but somebody asked, why did God put that little stupid tree in the garden anyway? Because Lucifer fell. Okay, now you got to look at it from God's standpoint. There's a different standpoint. So from God's standpoint, he knew that he gave Adam a, a, a choice, a will. And he put his goods into Adam and Eve. He put himself in there. And there's not one bad thing God has. So he put himself in Adam. So he knew that they could say no to the tree. They knew that he, they could, re, he, God knew that they could rebuke the devil. But he also knew that they could fall. But he chose to believe in them, not to look at them through their faults. And folks, that's a lesson to you and I. We need to look at one another as Jesus looks at us. Not at our faults, each other's faults. We're not mode hunters. We need to look at each other the way Jesus and look and believe the best of each other. But keep your eyes off a of man because man is not God. Just believe the best. So if God asks somebody to do something and they're there for the day, don't pick up and say, where you been? <laughs> Good to see you. Amen. You know, the first time you get up in the morning and you can't awake and come to yourself, God says, if you can hear him, good to see you. Hello. But we don't greet God that way. We don't walk with God that way because he's happy to see us. He's excited to see us. He's so holy and so righteous. We're wondering if he picked up on what we did wrong yesterday. He doesn't even care. So God does, he put the tree in the garden to prove to the devil that Adam was better than he was. But Adam was tricked and Eve was tricked and they sinned, right? Now, here's the big question. Did God know Adam would sin? He knows everything. I already answered it. Okay, yeah. That's a toughie, real toughie. But it's really a good one for people who believe that half the problems are here is because God wants them to teach us some kind of life. How can I serve a God that does that to people? So the answer has to be higher than just accepting that God would know that they would sin. No, God knew that they could sin, but believed they wouldn't sin. And that's why he said, don't eat to that tree. He says, I've set before you life and death. Today, tonight. God has set before you life and death. Are you going to leave out of here mad at the pastor and blah, 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 blah? You just chose death. Well, bless God, I, this is the way I am. You're going to die. You keep that all up too. you wish you were dead. Why haven't we learned the lesson of we are our worst enemy? Hello, why haven't we learned that lesson? Because the devil doesn't want us to learn it. So we need each other to encourage one another, to pray for one another. So God looked, didn't believe Adam would, but he already had a clause in there in case he did. Well, you mean God had a plan B? He always does. And a C and a D and an E because you need all those cover-up plans because you're not perfect. But the overall plan was sending Jesus to die and rise again. That is the greatest plan, God's plan for man. 
So now you're beginning to see how God looks. When he, when he talked to Job, Bob, it's a good one for us. When he talked to Job, remember the first two chapters? He's, he says that the sons of God came in to present themselves before God, and Satan came in among them. And God addresses him. He said, what are you doing? He wasn't supposed to be there. How did he get back up into heaven once God threw him out of heaven? He got back up by stealing the authority from Adam. He said, what are you doing? Yeah, I've been walking around the road, you know, in the world to and fro. I've been kind of strutting my stuff. And he said, well, have you seen my servant uh, Job? What did God say about him? That slime married an unsaved woman, just taught the kids how to curse, drink, and party. They, they don't like God. They can't get him to chapel. Sound familiar? So you're too busy to train your kids. So he was already feeling really, he says, well, have you considered him? Satan always considered a way to make your life miserable. So the way to overcome that is to sit with God first thing every day and let him give you the wisdom for the day, the authority along the way, and the power to stay through that day. I'm a poet and don't know it. Let's move right along. All right. So it says, look, of whom it was said, Isaac, your seed shall be called. Now, have I, I've just begun on verse 17 again. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He also received the promise, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed, your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figure or in a figurative sense. He represents Christ in a figurative sense. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, worshiping, learning, uh, leaning at the top of his staff. And by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Now, what did I leave out? Okay, is it, it's not there? Uh, where is my verse 23? Read it at real loud because it's not in my notes here. <laughs> by faith of Moses, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was called the son by his mother because they saw he was beautiful and they had no thought that he was naked. Amen, and that's the end of the chapter? No, okay, all right, all right. So, okay, yeah, it does. So, okay, now hold on. Point one, two, three, four, and five. Abraham was... Tested. Now, if I can take two minutes to explain, from God's standpoint, he never tempts us with evil. And the word test, try, and tempt are all the same word. So what do you, what do, you do about that? Well, from God's standpoint, he has a view. From the devil's standpoint, he has a view. And from your standpoint or our human standpoint, they have a view. So it goes like this. From the father's standpoint, he tests and proves what you can do or what you can't do. Why, do we do. why does he do that with us? So that we don't overstate who we are and think more highly than we are. We, he needs to prove to us who we are in him and prove to us who we're not without him. From Satan's standpoint, he tests and tempts because he doesn't know. He can't read your mind. So he throws suggestions and then monitors what you're going to do, how you're going to respond to it. Somebody pulls you off the side of the road. And now you're tempted whether to give him the gesture of peace or not. So from Satan's standpoint, he is testing and tempting, trying. From your standpoint, this is a yielding thing. Amen? You got the accuser. You got the judge, and you've got your advocate, our lawyer, Jesus. Amen? So from your standpoint, as long as you lean to Christ, focus on Christ, you are innocent of all accusations of the enemy, even if you're guilty. Even if you did do it, you're innocent. Why? Because you went to your advocate, and you said, Jesus, I'm sorry for that. Forgive me. And he goes, shh. You're forgiven. And the accuser says, he says, you can't accuse him anymore. I've forgiven him. He's completely restored. So the accuser is shut down. 
So immediately he goes over and tells Brother Big Nose, hey, look at that person strutting around like they've never sinned before. Go tell them they're false. So he then he sends somebody because he can't do it. We keep with Christ every day, saturate self every day. We're covered in the blood. The accuser has not anything to accuse you because you walked in, got cleansed, you got washed, you got set, you got dialed, you got filled, you got glorified, and you stand up and the devil goes, oh my God, I'll just wait till they forget to pray again. That's who you are. And you can understand why these Hebrews were Freaking out because they didn't have what you have. They didn't have 66 wonderful books. They only had stories that were passed down and scrolls they could read together. Aren't you glad we can sit around the campfire? We can have Bible study? Amen. And now you want to know why why the Spirit of God gets so ticked when you don't show up for church. Because you're upset at yourself. See what I'm saying? What do you want? How much do you want? How bad do you want it? How far are you willing to go to sit with God long enough for him to permeate you? The other day I was at the bank and the guy says, what, what are you doing? He said, I said, what, what do you mean, what am I doing? He says, there's an energy and a g- coming off of you. I can hardly look at you. I said, well, I'm blaming that on God. I didn't do anything but just pray in tongues all morning. You know what I don't know? I got to go through the routine. I had to go to the store. I had to go to the bank, make the deposit. I had to do all these things. I will pray in tongues about it. And then I'm singing a song. Walk into the bank and immediately everybody goes, ah! <laughs> wonderful as far as I'm concerned. I didn't even know that was happening. I had no idea the guy pointed it out. And then I had to come back the next day because a couple of checks were late to make that deposit. So we made sure we have enough for our rent and all that kind of stuff. And I walk in there, and the guy, the guy goes, See, there it is again. He was making this. These are all trainee, the trainee week. So these are all a bunch of new trainees. So God got a bunch of seeds in there. So that was good. Any questions, statements, anything you want to do before we catch an offering? Bob. What? Don't shut me off yet, dear. Of course he's not. Who says he was? He's a turkey. Yeah, there is a teaching that teaches that Satan's going to get saved one day. Okay, all right. Point two. So Isaac then obeyed God and blessed his two sons concerning these things to come. Jacob became Israel before God. Remember, he wrestled with God. He's a type of the new birth. Yep, his name was changed. Did you know when you get born again, God changes your name? And he gives you an endearing name. You'll find out what it is when you get there. Point three. By faith, Jacob blessed each of the sons of Joseph, worshiping. Worshiping, leaning on his staff. Point four, by faith, Joseph made mention of taking his bones out of Egypt as they departed, and what to do with them. And then point five, it's so amazing to see the power of transformation in the hands when hands are laid on and the blessings are imparted. 